And we are live to Facebook. Oh, wow. Nice. So, Craig, thank you. There we go. Hi, everybody out there in radio and Facebook uh, social media land. I'm live here with Craig McKench with Mojo uh, Coworking. And uh, we are number one celebrating his 10 year, their, that business's 10 year birthday on April the 1st. 2021. Uh, what was your original um, inspiration for opening Mojo Coworking? Well, Davine, first of all, thanks for having me on. Um, it's a great day to be um, talking to you because of our birthday party. Yeah. Uh, a COVID birthday party. I don't even know what that means. But uh, it's interesting, the inspiration 10 years ago, I was involved in, a, in an event called Hatchfest. I was the executive director and this would 2011 would have been the third year of Hatch. And one of the things that continually frustrated me in 2009 and 2010 was that all this creative energy came together in Asheville for a weekend. And then everybody went away and they all went back to their work and they all went back to their things that they were doing and they were separated. There was never a, a clubhouse, I guess you'd call it, a place for creative energy to stay all year long. And so that was primarily the inspiration behind Mojo is how can we create social entrepreneurial and creative energy in a, in a physical location. And, um, and so we opened it up in conjunction with the 2011 Hatchfest and it became the headquarters and the place where you logged in and got your registration packets and your badges for that, for that conference. And then of course it was able to establish itself in the community as an ongoing place for creative work. Yeah, and how many of us move here because Asheville puts out this creative vibe about it and then you get here and there's there was no place to go to like there is now because right. I moved here partially for the artistic creative vibe that was uh, just kind of ubiquitous in the country back in 1989. Wow. Yeah, well, and I think I've, we talked about this before, but when we came to Asheville in 2008, we had never been, we lived in Atlanta for 13 years prior, but had heard through whatever mystical forces are out there, had heard that Asheville was a creative city. And we came up uh, the, you know, late in the year before and discovered Asheville. And by within a year, we had moved there, moved here. Moved here, yeah. And did I never looked back, did you? I moved here from New Orleans and it was, that was a great city, but this, this, even back in 89, when hardly anything was going on downtown, it was still right. a good place. So, yep. so, um, as, as you say in, in your kind of, uh, promo, uh, Mojo Coworking, it's not necessarily work from home. It's, it's work anywhere. And certainly the pandemic has increased Mm -hmm. that awareness drastically is probably pushed it ahead. The reality of um, if you've got an internet connection and, and you're in the modern world, you're, you're probably able to do your work anywhere. That's right. I mean, especially, you know, there's different names for the category, but essentially if you think about people who can work from anywhere, they're typically knowledge-based workers, right? Whether that's creative or tech or any, any place that you can do your job remotely with a computer, you're a knowledge-based worker. And, and, and that's the type of person that finds Mojo co-working or any co-working space a great place to work. But you know, on, on the downside of it is there's still a lot of people out in the world who are not in that category and have really suffered a great deal from the, from the COVID and the shutdown and the, you know, the industries that, that got closed down. And, and that is a tough part about it, but I do feel that we are blessed in the sense that the knowledge-based workers have a place to come to work. And the trend of working from anywhere, which really started as work from home, they sent everybody home, go home and work. And um, people are now finding that it's isolating, of course. They're also finding that it's very difficult to separate your work day from your home life. And because if your computer's there on the kitchen table and you're working all day long, well, you just keep working or go back to it when you shouldn't maybe. And so when you come into a co-working space, you have a beginning and an end to your work day. 
and it makes it really helpful. And I think the third thing is, and we've heard this from every single member who, who's come in post pandemic or even during the pandemic, is that their productivity levels are 5,000% higher when they work here. They can get more done in two hours than they can in a few days at home. Fewer distractions, ability to focus. It's also more enjoyable because there's people here that they can talk to around the coffee pot and uh, around the drinking fountain. So while pandemic is still going on, what are the uh, protocols or the san sanitation protocols or, or uh, ways to keep everybody uh, the, fir safe. Yeah, the, the first the first step that we did was de-densified the space so you can imagine co-working is really the idea is shoulder to shoulder put the desks all in a big row and everybody works together across from each other and so we took an area for example that had eight desks and now there's only three so we really had to open up the floor space separate desks more uh, we have uh, kind of we don't have the clear plastic dividers but we have more like um uh, like fabric acoustic dividers that, that are in between desks. So that's just from a separation standpoint for the social distancing. And then we have, and it took a while, a lot of fighting, if you will, online for ordering sanitizing wipes, hand sanitizers. We, in May, we replaced all of our faucets in the bathrooms with touchless faucets. We also have touchless towel dispensers, touchless micro, antimicrobial soap dispensers, and um, so we're, we're very well set up like that. And then lastly, we every day wipe down the desks that are the common desks with um, Clorox bleach spray at, that will certainly wipe out 99.9% .9 of all germs. So how has it been at Mojo for uh, in this kind of lockdown situation and isolation situation? Have you had people coming in? Uh, in fact, so you know the quick the quick roller coaster journey is April we had to pretty much close down of last year because of COVID and the state mandates. Um, we were able to stay open a few hours a week because we do offer mail service and a lot of people in town have mailboxes here so they can't not get mail so we would come in and open up. I think it was like Tuesdays and Fridays for half days. Um, we didn't allow any other guests in or any visitors. But then starting in May we opened the doors back up to existing members. They could come in if they wanted. And then starting in July, we opened it up again for tours and prospective new customers. Um, and it was slow going, at, but I would say around about the fall, before that holiday surge of COVID that came through, we, we definitely brought in a number of new people, um, making sure they understand the COVID safety rules that we have. But, but Devin, now, starting about a month ago, maybe even over the winter in December onward, there are so many people in America on the go. They may live in Brooklyn, but they're taking three or four months and they're traveling the country because they can, they have a laptop. And so they'll come in here and rent an office for a week, or they'll drop in for a day, or they'll come in for a half day. Right now we have one, two, three, we have three people in the office as I speak who are from out of town, who are visiting. One's from Birmingham, Michigan, one is from uh, Boulder, Colorado, and there's somebody else that I don't know where they're from, but they're, they're on the road visiting. So it's kind of like, instead of uh, Airbnb bedrooms, it's kind of Airbnb business, isn't it? In fact, it, it, it really is. And it's almost like you have to, you have to be ready for it. And, and, and it's almost a bit of a marketing pivot to make sure that people know that they can rent a desk for an hour, as opposed to becoming a member for a month. And so we've been trying to push that message on social media and some of our other um, outlets. So are there any negatives to remote work? Um, no, there are no negatives to remote work. Um, there, there's a, I actually stumbled upon this great book that I read probably 15 years ago. Um, it's called Orbiting the Giant Hairball. And it was written by a creative director from Hallmark Cards. And it was back before there was such a thing as remote working and, and any of that. But he worked for Hallmark Cards, and he said that all big businesses, including Hallmark, they're a giant hairball. They're just a mess. There's political stuff. There's this quagmire of how do you get stuff through the system. But there's also good things in the hairball that make businesses work. But if you orbit the hairball, you're just far enough away where you're not in the gunk. 
but you still have access to the energy of the hairball. So that's the kind of the summary of the book, Orbiting the Giant Hairball. And I think that's very much what like remote work is. If you have a company that you work for and they're based in DC or New York or LA, but you're able to work remotely, technology today allows you to be tethered in, visit when you need to, but also have enough independence and creative muscle flexing that you can do on the outside. I uh, am delighted to hear you use that analogy because I'm obviously uh, with a radio station and we're trying to avoid some of that in, in the inner part of the hairball part that, that um, happens uh, in situations, in work situations. So uh, it's interesting that there's a book about it and I'm gonna have to I'm going to have to look look that up. You can put it up in the show notes after the show. Yeah, show <laughs> notes. So um, what is to come as far as uh, businesses being positioned uh, to get past COVID and uh, as from the perspective of people coming to Mojo mm -hmm. Coworking? Well, here's what I, I think. And I think also, Davey, and I want to let you know, and maybe we can talk about this later as well, is just the, the overall notion of trends. Yeah. Um, my marketing company has a trends division, and we do a lot of trend research for clients. Um, and in thinking about trends around working, so I, don't, I, I would even go one step above co-working, trends in the, in the workspace, like what does work in the future look like? Obviously, COVID accelerated everything. So there is not only the trend of work from anywhere, um, but there's also this new principle that's being pursued by a lot of the larger companies, which is called home and hub. And that is where a company that may have had 200,000 square feet of office space post pandemic might have a home office of 20,000 square foot of office space. And then they'll have hubs around the country. And those hubs will either be their own buildings or they will be hubbed in co-working spaces around the country so that their remote workers can still go in and have meetings, but will work some days at home and some days in the hub. And so that's a, that's certainly is a, a second trend. And then um, the third trend is just that people are, the, the bosses in the world who never thought that remote work would be productive are learning that it is very productive. And the, the trend that's happening is you can't just turn people loose to go work from home. Bigger companies now, and especially in the tech world, they're hiring uh, heads of remote work. It's a new title that a lot of companies are hiring for. And your job is not only to help employees who want to be remote, how to get them set up with equipment, how to get them set up with protocols and, and the like, but also they also train the managers who are managing people who are working remotely on how to better get the productivity and the morale and uh, keeping the whole team together as a, as a manager of remote people. So this new position is going to be continuing to accelerate that trend of work from anywhere. So back to uh, your, your new Endeavor Trend Stories, mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about that some. Absolutely. Yeah, trend, trendstories.co is the website. And um, it's really based on a lot of the work that I did at Native Marketing um, back in the uh, early, early 2010s. Turner Broadcasting hired us as a trend spotting agency. And so for three years, we managed trends in entertainment, media, technology, and pop culture. And basically, we did trend research on a quarterly basis, came into Turner Broadcasting and did company-wide presentation on the top trends, and then spent the next day working with each of the different um, brands, CNN, Cartoon Network, TNT, helping them devise ways of implementing those trends within their company to be ahead of the game. And, and so we did that for quite a long time. And, the, and the, the final project that we did with them was we created a three-day trend conference within Turner Broadcasting, and where, where instead of just talking about the trends, we brought in the, the actual practitioners of those trends from the different companies. So we had Intel in there, we had Fast Company in there, we, we did a maker fair at Turner. And so Trend Stories is really based, building around the business of my love for trends and my passion around that. And so we, we think of 
you know, there's a, there's a, fr a term in the trends world called a VUCA, VUCA world, V-U-C-A, and it stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And we live in a VUCA world. It's always that way, and it's always going to be that way. I mean, who before March of 2020 would have thought that a pandemic would do what it did on our world? You can't predict things, but there's that very much emphasizes the volatility, the uncertainty, and the complexity. And so what, what trend stories helps companies do is to anticipate the opportunities. Look at the trends, anticipate the opportunities, but not just in a willy-nilly way, we offer a kind of a, a structured approach to the trends. So how do you think about trends on an ongoing basis? How do you integrate them into your company's thinking? And, and, and how do you make sure that you're not just isolating a single trend, but looking at the trends across different categories and, and from your own product and, and category world to other ancillary and adjacent categories? What do businesses need to do to prepare for all the future uncertainties that we have going on in the world today that we're all all too familiar with? One of the things is, is just to understand the first step that I recommend to any business is to first understand the rate of change within your own company. And it's a very easy exercise to do. You can do it with your own team members is essentially you can put a a timeline on a wall, a big horizontal stripe with today in the middle, and then give everybody sticky notes and ask them to write down kind of privately in, in a room, what are things that have happened in the world and in your company, and go ahead and stick those on the timeline of when they happened. And then you can get a real, you can step back from that and get a real visual look at how fast or slow change happens in your business. And you can re relate that to other changes in the world that are happening around you as well. So the rate of change in technology in your business may be really fast or slow, but the rate of cultural shifts may be faster than technological shifts. Each, co each company has its own cadence and understanding from the inside out is really a really great first step to see where it's headed. And then once you do that, it, it really becomes do you have a way on an ongoing basis to have somebody in your company be always on the lookout for what's happening around or do you want to have another outside firm like trend stories help you to um, have access to those trends and to make sense of them because if they're if you just get handed a trend or a list of trends it isn't often that useful because you have to make sense of the trends and, and that's why we call it trends intelligence so what uh, got you uh, involved or interested in trends in the first place? Um, the opportunity came up here. I was, we were here in Asheville and one of my former colleagues reached out to me and said that Turner was looking to hire a trend expert as a permanent full-time position. And so I reached out to that person at Turner and I said, I have a better idea, save the headcount let us do trend research for you. And she said, Craig, I've always heard that you were from the future anyway. So this is a really great idea. And that started the, the real deep dive into a, our three year relationship with Turner and, and, and beyond it led to other things. And even when I was in New York um, in 2015, 2016, um, I joined a company called Kantar Futures and they used to be called the futures company then they're called then they were called Kantar futures um and it, it's a it's a a consulting firm that helps clients learn about future trends and our clients at Kantar were everything from ford motor company best buy uh campari um chase bank and so these are large companies who have you know, massive budgets to make sure that they're staying on top of every trend. Um, but it doesn't, and this is the thing that I'm trying to do is I'm trying to democratize that a bit. You don't have to be a big company with a big budget to study and look at trends. But if you're not thinking about what's happening in the next two to three years, 
then you will probably be taken by surprise of something that comes around the corner that you weren't thinking about. What do you think about the uh, downfall of major retailers like Sears and other companies that uh, used to be absolute staples in people's houses? I lived in Germany for about four years and we ordered everything from the Sears catalog. I know, isn't that crazy? I think my brother, this is a sidebar, but my, my, my younger brother lives in Michigan and the house that he bought, whatever, 20 years ago, was actually a house that somebody else had bought from the Sears catalog. Yeah, and uh, you know, a lot of the houses here in Asheville that were built in the 20s are also kit houses that were either Sears, Montgomery Wards, or my house is one by Lewis Manufacturing. Wow. Apparently, uh, there was so much uh, native wood here that they just was had a gold mine and wood to mill. And my house was uh, manufactured in Johnson City and then sent over on a flatbed truck and uh, uh, Coleman Construction cons constructed the house. Assembled. Wow. Assembled the houses. Yeah. So yeah, and so well, that trend, just that trend right there of Kit Homes had a great run and then boom, it was gone. Right, yeah, I mean, and a lot of that is economically driven as far as it became more affordable to build, sadly, a lower quality house in many cases, but stick built on site as opposed to prefabricated and shipped. Uh, there was a great company up in Boston area, I think it was called Acorn Homes, and I went and visited them um, but they, they literally had blueprints that converted into cut lists in the factory. So somebody would just cut two by fours all day long and right. then they would bundle it all up, send it over to the other place. They'd build entire walls with the window holes cut in it, everything drilled for pre-drilled for all the power that would go through it. And then when you got it on site, you assembled wall by wall, but the engineering was far superior because it was done in a indoor environment with very accurate everything associated with it. But your question about retail and, and trends in retail, I mean, it's obviously one of the major changes that happened was the uh, the advent of Amazon and the, the technology powered behind that. Um, it, it was slowly changing and that change was accelerating, but of course the pandemic, like it did with most trends, put it into warp speed and yes. it became, you know, anything that has to do with ordering and getting shipped. Now, now the opportunity is what can we do with all this cardboard? How do, how do we reinvent a, a secondary use for cardboard? Yeah, for because cardboard. there's so much of it. Well, so small businesses uh, that may be thriving now, they, they need to always have their eye on uh, is this is this sustainable? Are we are are we on the right track? So, how do you help businesses um, uh, uh, keep track of and be nimble? Because I think it has has something to do with being nimble and being able. Small companies can turn around on a dime much more quickly than big corporations, right. and so that's an advantage. Uh, but so, how do you help people uh, people who come to you? keep their eye on on the future that's exactly Without giving away your trade secrets well no i mean there's different ways of doing it and there's also different budget parameters as well i mean some companies have have not only the the, the budget but also the manpower they, they may already have a consumer insights division where they do consumer research so they know what's happening today they know what happened yesterday but they don't know they're not staffed and organized to know what's going to happen in the future and so in those kind of organizations, it's more about helping them set up a framework within their company to, uh, to discover and, and assess and Im implement trends within. For smaller companies, um, what we often do is what we call a trend sprint, where we take 20 days, specific window of time with using trends to address a specific challenge. Maybe they're beginning a new product innovation cycle. Maybe there's a new product that they're launching. Maybe they um, are refreshing their brand or repositioning their company, or maybe they just want to like get their internal teams excited about 
any and all of those things. So we can go in and help a, help a company put together a trends, do a trend sprint, and then bring it in and then do a half day workshop or a full day workshop to get that implemented in their company. So do people just uh, key in online um, trend stories to get in touch with you? Trendstories.co. Dot go. Get me. There's a place to set up a phone call or uh, or inquire with a website. Uh, wow. A... And so on Mojo Coworking, how do people find you uh, under Mojo Coworking? MojoCoworking.com will get you there. Um, and, and definitely people seem to be finding it because they come in and they say they searched for coworking in Asheville and they, they come here, which we love. Um, and then the uh, kind of the anchor business of that they all weirdly interrelated so mojo co-working is the home of native marketing native marketing is my boutique branding and marketing agency and within native marketing trend stories is one of our services so it's kind of a, a triumvirate of, of of businesses that all somewhat interrelate well and, and, and sorry davy one last thing davy sorry is that the other great thing about having a co-working space to the very first question you ask which is we know why, why does it exist? Right now, there's people in here who do web design, web coding, writing, legal work, financial work. Um, there's a solar energy company in here. And so the, the bandying about of new ideas and the collaborating for, for solving problems within just this team of people here is amazing. And that's, it, it's the fastest way to move from ideas to action is by having uh, uh, collisions of, of people who are kind of like-minded and, and energized. So what would you, what would, what would your sales pitch be to someone who had never considered co-working before, have just heard about it and are wondering, well, hmm, uh, what's, what's, your, what's your favorite sales pitch on that? Um, you know, the good news is after 10 years, just in general, and, and with notoriety of companies like WeWork and, and things like that, there's a lot of not, there's a lot more knowledge about co-working, but I still think there's a fair number of people who don't realize that it's not just this loud place where people are all over. It's, it's really quite professional. Um, one of the ways that I describe it kind of in an elevator pitch is if you, if you travel a lot and you at an airport, you can either sit in the the seating area by the gate or you can go to the sky club lounge and have quiet professional experience mojo co-working is like the sky club lounge sky club lounge and other coffee shops for example are more just like you're sitting by the gate i see so uh and if 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 someone has clients that they need to meet with there's spaces at Mojo Coworking for privacy in a professional setting. Right. In addition to open desks, we have private offices. We also have four conference rooms. I'm sitting in one of them right now. Um, and so this is a six person conference room. We have a 16 person conference room. We have a large meeting area on weekends that will hold 40 or 50 people. And then we have a, like a 12 person room and a two person room. And so uh, people making recordings, uh, like for example, doing interviews like you and I are doing right now, uh, or uh, deciding to do a podcast with someone, do you have facilities for recording? Set yeah, the, the room that I'm sitting in right now was used probably five or six years ago when podcasting was first starting, a, a gentleman came in and I forget what it was podcast, it was about Asheville and he did a podcast every week with somebody else in here. We don't technically have a soundproof audio safe room as you might, as you, as you think of it that way, but we do have quiet rooms that people can use. Yeah. And uh, frankly, um, you don't necessarily, like we're in a, we're in our office space right now, but if you've got headphones, and a mic, right. you don't have to have a totally in the past analog kind of soundproofed room. Correct. So. Yep. And we think that the whole idea of Zoom meetings has changed all of the professionalness in a sense. There's people are much more accepting of a cat walking by, stepping yeah, away to get your tea, 
or whatever. Like, listen, I'll be back in a second. I got to run and get a cup of coffee. It's it's all fine. Yeah, yeah. Well, Craig McCanch, thank you so much for doing this interview. And again, happy birthday on April the 1st, 2011 to 2021 on Mojo Coworking. And uh, uh, we look forward to hearing from you in the future about trend stories. Right. And um, do you want to end with anything? Do you have anything you want to wrap up with? Um, you know, the last thing I would just say is that, um, and I, and I did a Facebook post on this today, the two reasons why Mojo Coworking has been so successful. One of them is my son, Ian, who has been the manager and community director for Mojo since almost the very beginning has such a commitment to customer service and hard work and professionalism that people feel taken care of here. And so that's one reason. The other reason is just the awesome members that we've had here for the last 10 years. I mean, I can't, I can't even listen. I tried to tag a bunch of them on the Facebook post that I could remember, but the, the people who are at Mojo give Mojo the Mojo. So that's, um, that's how I guess it's a good place to end. Yeah. And I love your graphic on the screen back there. It's been, it's been interesting seeing what you've got scrolling there. <laughs> so thank you very much. And, um, I'll talk to you again soon. Okay. Bye, Davine. Thanks. Bye. -bye.